And yes, we're going to start in a brief minute. So uh, ho hopefully everybody's having a, a great family day. It uh, has been fun for us at the exploration place. We had a blast actually uh, at our pop-up. So um, everybody that could join us today, we had a lot of fun using the, uh, the Kiva uh, planks and also some Osobots in, in, in our retail section as well. So we're doing also uh, an event on February 28th. If you want to meet us and join us at the pop-up. Also, we're, we're having uh, Kiva and Osobots. So that's for, for the Pro-D day. So if you want to join us from 11 to 5, we're going to be there doing this uh, exciting program. And, you know, it's for, for everybody, right? We don't have uh, age restrictions or anything, but it we guarantee you that you're going to have lots of fun. Just uh, if you're 12 and up, we just require, just for the programming space, such as Kiva and Osobots, we just require you to be fully vaccinated. And... Kids can uh, join us without, a, they don't need the vaccine passport. Just if you are uh, 11 and under, you can require a vaccine passport. But if you are 12 and up, we require one. So, and basically just to keep everybody safe uh, because it's a programming space and, you know, it's for, for kids. So we need to keep <coughs> our kids safe. Right? That's why we, we ask adults or um, people 12 and up to be vaccinated, right? Just to keep the programming space uh, safe for everybody, right? And also we are under um, the VC government mandate and we're the museum, right? So basically we are <coughs> under a different uh, man mandate and we have to follow the government um, guidelines, right? So um, thank you everybody for joining us. We are going to start now. And basically, I want to thank you for joining us uh, for this virtual adult speaker series. My name is Carlos Hernandez, and I'm the manager of in-person community programs here at the Exploration Place Museum and Science Center. And we're located in Prince George, BC, and honored to live and work here on the traditional territory of the Clay Tene First Nations people. And I will also like to thank our media sponsor, CBC Daybreak North, for supporting this series. And at the bottom of the screen, you uh, should see a Q&A speech bubble. Please post your questions there at the end of the presentation, <coughs> and then we'll have our speaker um, answering them. And tonight's speaker, uh, her name is Cherry Chai. Cherry Chai is the founder of the Speak Right Academy, and she is passionate about how language is used across different cultures. She speaks about the importance or she will speak about the, uh, the importance of language in breaking social barriers and the different strategies one can use to communicate with people from different backgrounds. Cherry will talk about bridging with language. This is our topic for tonight. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Hope you enjoy this uh, awesome presentation and we'll pass things over to you, Cherry Chai. Thank you, Carlos, for introducing me. I would like to thank the Exploration Place for hosting this event. And I would like to thank the CBC for sponsoring it. <clears throat> and also thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. So now I would like to share my screen. So just give me a moment, please. Okay. Share it. <clears throat> I'd like to first do a land acknowledgement. It's my honor to present to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Kletli Tene First Nation. The word Kletli means where the two rivers flow together, referring to how the Nachako River's flow enters the Fraser River at Prince George, BC. The word Tene means people, as can be seen in the photo of the Kletli Tene drum group. The it's clear how the Kletli Tene is a community that is built on and around the strength of its people. Hadi in their native Dakar language means hello and Daim O means how are you. I urge everyone to find out and learn how to say hello and how are you in the indigenous language spoken in your area and use them to build meaningful conversations and relationships with the indigenous people in your community. Okay, so to begin this session, I would like to ask you to ask yourself, 
Have you ever come across a time when communicating with someone from a different culture and where you didn't quite understand the person, what the person meant, but then that conversation just ended at that? I'll give you an example from one of my travel stories in rural Thailand. I was, it was the end of my trip and I was all ready to leave the motel <clears throat> to head to the airport. But before leaving the, the motel, I asked the receptionist, I said, I asked, how long does it take to travel to the airport? And the receptionist said, thank you for visiting. Please come again. Bye. So, you know, maybe she didn't understand what I was asking. And she probably heard the word airport. So she assumed that I was telling her that I'm now leaving to the airport. You know, and as I was also rushing for time, I said, okay, bye. Thank you for hosting me in a very friendly way. And I left. So um, the receptionist seemingly had misheard my question. However, I believe that in, in other instances, there could be other reasons for that kind of conversation to happen. And so now I'd like to explore some of the reasons uh, with you. So the first one, it could be fear of embarrassment. Maybe that receptionist was afraid of embarrassing herself because she knows she doesn't have a good command of the language spoken. <coughs> I was also afraid of offending her by insisting an answer for my question as I knew it might embarrass her. And you know, the second reason might be, you know, don't know how. Maybe that receptionist didn't know the language spoken well enough to respond and she didn't know any other strategies she could use to help her communicate with me. And I also didn't know what strategies I could use to communicate with someone who didn't understand my language. And the third reason could be no time. Maybe the receptionist knew that I was checking out that day and she didn't want to hold me back from catching my flight you know so she didn't want to struggle to you know find struggle with a difficult question and I was also you know indeed rushing for time and trying to catch my flight so I didn't want to pursue an answer so today I'm going to share with you some skills and techniques to give you the confidence to communicate with someone from a different background effectively so you can successfully communicate at every conversation even if you don't have the time. Okay. But first, I would like to introduce you to the cultural iceberg. Because um, we need to understand how language is related to culture. So this cultural iceberg is created by anthropologist Edward T. Hall. As you can see, um, the surface traits are like language, food, fine arts, clothing, holidays and festivals. So, if you travel to any country for a holiday, these are the traits that you will see. These are the traits above the water. Right? And but for the, the ones below the water, like your know, family values, biases, um, body language, all these are not as easy to see. They are quite difficult to see. And if you'll be able to see them easier if you spend a longer time, in that country or in that culture, and you fully immerse yourself by doing things and learning about that culture. So today I'm going to show you how language is the connection. It's the first tool of communication which connects you from the top traits above the surface to under the surface. Then now it begs the question. It begs the question, why? Why? Why is there a need to look below the surface? Right. To help you answer that question, I would like to tell you another travel story of mine from Vietnam. You know, this photo shows a typical busy street in Vietnam. I'm going to show you a YouTube video of how it actually looks like. So I'm just going to full screen this and... So as you can see from that 
that video, right, it's quite uh, kind of uh, dangerous to cross the streets there, but it's actually not. It just seems that way. So as a traveler back then, I didn't dare to cross the road at all. Um, <clears throat> but then my Vietnamese friend taught me a really good technique. You know? She said, firstly, you have to be brave. Secondly, you need to try to look at the eyes of the drivers, right? And you know, if the driver looked back directly at you with his eyes or her eyes, then you can safely cross. And, and then do not hesitate to cross because the drivers are expecting you to cross. If, if the drivers are not looking at you directly in your eyes or they avoid your eye contact, do not cross. It wouldn't be safe to cross. So with that technique learned, I was able to cross <coughs> this street, this kind of street on my own for the weeks that I was traveling in Vietnam by myself. So the reason why I want to show you this example is because the strong eye contact, although no words are used, is a body language which allows me and the driver to communicate to each other on a busy street like this. As the saying goes, it takes two hands to clap. There is, there is a strong need for both parties on that busy street to participate in this eye contact communication as a pedestrian doesn't want to get injured and the driver doesn't want to injure a person. Right? So back the question of why. Why is there a need below the surface? Is that need as strong as not wanting to kill someone or not wanting to be killed in a road accident? So I'm going to tell you, um, you know, three, re three reasons that I believe will help you to find out what, how strong the need is. And with these three reasons, I have some thinking questions with each, each reasons, and I will be posting them in the chat but after I finish this portion. So let me read them out to you. <coughs> Firstly, globalization. So the rate of globalization has increased in recent years, a result of rapid advancement in communication and technology, transportation. So I'd like to ask you to ask yourself, what if your boss, coworker, neighbor, or friend is from a different culture? will you be able to build a good relationship with them? So that's the first question. And the second question is, if you don't travel, what if your kids travel to a different country in the future for job or study opportunities? So that's question number two. <coughs> Next question. Regardless of whether it's within the same culture or across the borders, do you think culture evolves repeatedly through marriage and our children's marriage. Okay, so that, those are the three thinking questions that relates to globalization. So the second reason is to fight discrimination. <clears throat> In today's political climate, as, it, as we can see, um, we can see how divided the world can get from discrimination. <clears throat> Having been an immigrant at two different countries in my life, I have had my fair share of discrimination. And now I would like to ask you to ask yourself, have you been at the receiving end of racism or discrimination before? If not, have you spoken to someone who has? And lastly, if you have not experienced it before firsthand and have not spoken to someone who has, would you be able to genuinely believe that someone else has? So that's sort of questions that you guys can ponder about. Um, and now let's move on to the third reason, connection to roots. Hmm. See. So children of immigrants find it hard, you know, they can find it hard to connect with their grandparents when they don't speak the same language as them. <clears throat> Similar to children of immigrants in Canada or America who don't speak their parents' mother tongue, um, the young generations the young generation in Singapore also suffer from the same issue, <clears throat> including myself. You know, so because Singapore has once been colonized by the British in the past, and English has become the main focus since then. Growing up, I was closer to my maternal grandmother as compared to my paternal grandmother. And the reason is because I don't know how to speak my, my paternal grandmother uh, dialect, Hakka. And, she, and my paternal grandmother didn't know how to speak English as well. 
However, I was able to connect really well with my maternal grandmother because I knew how to speak her language, Cantonese. And she knew, she learned how to speak English from attending grammar schools during the colonization period. So now I'd like to ask you to ask yourself questions. Can you imagine how your relationship with your grandparents would be like if you and they don't speak the same language? Would your bond with your grandparents be affected? And would it be difficult to find out more about your grandparents' life, history, or culture if language were a barrier? Okay. So those are the three questions connected. And now that we have seen <clears throat> those three reasons of why it's needed to look below the surface, you know, connecting to connection to roots, let me just repeat it, connection to roots, fight discrimination and globalization. <coughs> we can now move on to finding out how, how history, culture, and beliefs create language. Okay. So this is the Chinese word called Tzu, which means to exit, as you can see from this fire escape sign. The, it says exit at the bottom of the Chinese word Tzu. It also can mean to go out or to get out. And um, in ancient China, I'm just going to tell you a bit of a history, uh, the history that, that gave birth to this word. So in ancient China, there was an emperor and the emperor would exile um, lawbreakers, right? Like exile lawbreakers to far away mountains. So as you can see the characters, it looks like two, two, of, two mountains attached together. This is how the word was born. And this also shows how it's, you know, connected to history. Words can be connected to history. And for audience members, members from Prince George BC, I believe you, you might be able to recognize this business logo on Victoria Street, their escape room business called Exit PG. Just a fun trivia here. So the next one I want to point out is how our culture can give birth to words as well. So curry, C-U-R-Y, is derived from the word curry, K-A-R-I, which is the Tamil language. Tamil is the dialect of the Indian, of the Indian language. And curry means sauce or condiment for rice. <clears throat> curry is also made from the curry tree leaves, the curry tree um, plant, which is why they, they probably name it curry. <coughs> So um, this is a very good example of how our culture and our food can also produce words. And the next one, you can see how beliefs can create um, words as well. So in the 14th century, century um, there's a saying, um, God be with ye. And uh, over time, in order to be more secular and applicable to other groups, this word has been evolved into goodbye. And I believe everybody knows what goodbye is. So. Now, let's see how history, culture, and beliefs influence the way we use language. So previously, it was how it creates words. And now, you can see how it influenced the way we use it, use the language. <coughs> so let's see. Hmm. Um, with the understanding of history, culture, and beliefs create language. Okay, There are differences in the way we behave across cultures. And individualism and collectivism can be one of the reasons why. So let's see. In Asia, I'm going to tell you a bit of a, a bit of a background, a bit of a story. In Asia, when we ask, <coughs> when you want to ask someone, have you had breakfast? We would say the phrase, 你吃饱了吗? And 你吃饱了吗? literally translates to are you full yet? So instead of over here, they will ask you, like, have you eaten breakfast, right? So the focus of that Chinese statement it's, uh, is to find out if that person is satiated, if that person is full, if that person had enough food. In many Asian cultures, right, as you can see from this picture of monks collecting food, and you know, they're actually called elms, collecting elms from the people, they would walk the street every morning at daybreak, um, to collect elms, which are food given by the people of their kindness, giving food to elders, giving food to God, giving food to monks, uh, that can be a sign of, uh, they can be viewed as a sign of very high respect. So this could explain 
how the people look out for the survival of others with a collective mindset and how they, they view food, you know, as a high regard. And I'm going to tell you, you know, to, to explain more about the differences between how uh, individualistic society view food uh, or view um, this you know, food giving versus a collective, collective mindset view food as a food giving. I'm going to tell you another uh, travel story of mine. Right, so when I was traveling in Korea, South Korea, <coughs> I was there for a few months because I was teaching English. But my, I have, a, I had a, I have a Korean, uh, American friend from USA, and who was living with me. She was surprised at why our Korean host would keep giving her more and more food, despite her saying, "Oh, I'm so full, you know, thank you so much, I'm really full." And and even after the dinner, she would say, "Okay, here, this is a packet of extra food for you for your breakfast the next day." So you know, when she tell me this, I had. I had accepted it to be really normal because in my culture, food giving is very normal. So I didn't really like, I didn't really understand <coughs> why she would have such a big reaction to it, right? Although it's a, it's a good way, in a good way. So I only realized the extent of the difference in culture when I was traveling in Canada after that, that experience with her. Um, so in Canada, I was, uh, I was staying with a host and that one day, I was, uh, you know, the, the host had told me he had had, a, he had, had an early dinner at 4.30 p.m. So I, I began cooking my dinner, right? And after cooking, I had such a huge pot of food on the stove, you know. So I was thinking, you know, now it's already 6.30, you know, maybe my host is hungry now because it's two hours since he ate. So I was thinking, you know, how about maybe I should ask him because I don't feel good. Um, eating alone, you know, in his kitchen because he was my host. So I offered, I tried to offer food to that host who had already eaten his early dinner and the grandson of that host became really upset and he asked me, Sherry, didn't you, didn't you hear what my, my grandpa said? Like, he has eaten his dinner at 4.30 p.m. So this made me realize that then and then, it made me realize the difference between my collective mindset from my culture versus the host and the host grandson's individualistic mindset <coughs> from their culture. It's a different culture. And it, it really shows me through those, that, those two experiences. Okay, so next, the next way two cultures can be different, right? Is the high power distance versus low power distance. And these are sociological terms, but I'm gonna to explain to you what it means. So high power distance is where Lower, there's lower equality. So higher inequality means lower quality. So it means basically means it's a higher amount of unfairness. Okay. And it also means the freedom of choice. There's a lower freedom of choice. Because when you have a very high power over you, you have not much choice from yourself. And low power distance, it means the opposite. Right, you have a uh, higher equality, and people don't tolerate inequality as much, and they have very good freedom of choice. So, I'm going to tell you how um, a story, a personal story of my husband and I, of how this plays out in language and how this plays out in uh, culture differences. <coughs> um, so I have a toddler. He's two turning three, he's still 2.9, 2 2.5 years old. And he loves to climb on us, on my husband and on me. So what I would say to my toddler when he climbed is, pa, which literally translates to, don't want climb, the three words, okay? So my husband who has been um, doing his Duolingo and he has been diligently learning his Mandarin from the phone app, he knew what I said. He knew the three words meant don't want to climb. And he asked me, why am I dictating what my toddler wants to him? Right? Because if he were to ask his, his son, he would say don't climb. He wouldn't want to dictate what he wants. And I realized that, you know, that the way the Chinese sentence for don't which include the word want, could be tied back to how my culture is you know, with the high power distance. 
because growing up, my parents would not ask me at a restaurant what I would want to eat, right? They, they would make that decision. They would order the food and we just eat what they ordered. But over here, as compared to kids over here, they are generally asked, you know, when you go to a restaurant, they'll ask, what would you like to eat? You know, and um, let's see if we have a picture. So I see I have a taller picture climbing. So the second picture, you can see <coughs> a lazy Susan. So um, this could also be seen in the way we dine. In ma many Asian dining cultures, uh, we, it's, com it's common to have this lazy Susan where we have shareable dishes, you know, instead of as compared to a Western culture where we have individual plates of our own. And this is probably why it's, um, it's easier for a Western culture to, to ask the kid, what would you like to eat? Because the kid has his own plate of food instead of sharing the food with the whole family at the dinner table on the lazy Susan, right? So next we can see <coughs> how high context versus low context, how can cultures may differ between these two. And now I'm gonna to explain to you what high context versus low context mean. So high context cultures are those that communicate in ways that are implicit. So you got, what does it mean? It means that you've got to read in between the lines. There are like non-verbal cues that you've got to listen to, right? And it relies heavily on the context, the background, the context, the story behind it. In contrast, you know, low context means that it's, uh, it relies explicit, on explicit verbal communication. You've got to be very direct in what you say. So I would like to show you this photo. This photo is the poster of a, a a movie called Joy Lock Club. It's a very old movie. And basically it's a it's an immigrant story. It shows um, the daughters, how the daughters couldn't have a hard time with the relationship with their mothers because their mothers have been born and bred in China, but their daughters have been born and bred in America. So they have a cultural crash, a, a, a rub. So now I'm going to show you a small snippet. I'm going to go to my YouTube. I'm just going to show you. <laughs> but the worst was when Rich criticized my mother's cooking and he didn't even know what he had done. As is the Chinese cook's custom, my mother always insults her own cooking, but only with the dishes she serves with special pride. This dish not salty enough. No flavor. It's too bad to eat. <coughs> Please. <coughs> That was our cue to eat some and proclaim it the best she'd ever made. You know, Linda, all this needs is a little soy sauce. <gasps> okay, so I'm going to explain a bit what just happened there. <coughs> Let me just go on to full screen. So as we saw just now, right, um, the... The mother, when she came out with the dish, um, she self-insulted her dish. Because in China, they are very um, particular about not losing their face, you know, not wanting to be embarrassed. So, um, and they are also very relationship-based. So, you know, the, the person wouldn't want to lose their face, but the people around the person would try actively to protect your face. So in Chinese, there's a saying called, I'll give you face. Which literally means I give you face because I want to protect your face, you know, so you don't lose face. So the relationship there, they, they really hold it, the, the, the face, right? Um, but as in Western culture, it tends to be more task based. So um, as you can see from that video, the mother self insults because she she wants to avoid the embarrassment if her dish actually turns out to be under expectations. So she'll be like, oh, I self-insult first. And, you know, in case it's not very good, you know, at least I have self-insulted myself. But then the people around her in her own culture would be like, oh, I have to protect her face. So I will, I will compliment her, you know, even if it's not good, I will compliment her, you know. But in, in the Western uh, culture with more task based as you can see from the American boyfriend he straight away wanted to impress the mom because the mom the mother would be his future mother-in-law so he wanted to impress the mother future mother-in-law and say yeah I'm going to try to fix a fish 
I'm going to douse it in soy sauce, you know, problem fixed. So he failed to, you know, that the American boyfriend failed to read between the lines. He failed to read the context behind it, you know, because he's from a culture that has low context versus a culture that's high context. Okay, so next, next we're going to see another, <coughs> another, um, you know, way of how different cultures can differ. And I'm saying this reason is applies to, uh, to cultures, to families in the same culture. So even within your same country, even within your same culture, different families have different cultures. And this is uh, between my husband and I. So when I first came to Canada, um, before before leaving him to drive away in his car, I would say, okay, I love you, drive safe. And my husband would get <coughs> really upset about it. He would say, oh, why do you ask me to drive safe? Um, you know, haven't I been driving safe my entire life? You know, so, so immediately I would recognize that, you know, it's, uh, he hasn't heard it before. You know, it's, it's not what he's familiar to. So I, I explained to him, you know, drive safe is what everybody say as like a parting well wish. You know. So I, he suggested, oh, maybe safe journey will be a better one. So I've been using safe journey as well. So I want to point this out because this, shows a difference in word choice. Sometimes even within the same culture, different families have different ways of speaking. Okay. So as you can tell, <coughs> it's going to be very difficult to communicate with someone from a different culture. But don't be, don't do fret. I'm here to share with you some techniques and skills. But first, we've got to ask that question. Why is it so difficult? Why? Right? So I can, ex I can try to explain to you why is it so dis difficult. I believe um, I have two reasons. Firstly, is the my culture versus others' culture. First, we got to understand that why is it so difficult? Because people, people see what they want to see and they don't always see um, what you see, right? It's, it's only human nature that we take it for granted um, that our culture is the way things are or should be because we live it every day. So when you see a person from a different culture or with a different culture, um, you see that person's culture as the other and establish that the other culture is not the norm. And with that thinking, you fail to see that that different culture is just as normal to that person with that culture. <coughs> right? So this, you know, with this uh, uh, thinking, it, it creates a power dynamic between the two person which could make it harder for values such as respect and patience to be held in the exchange. And um, to, demonstrate, to demonstrate how, um, I have one very personal experience I really wanted to show, to, to, to tell you this, but uh, this experience, because it's uh, something that I'm very, very grateful for, so I'm very excited to share with you. And this could be a very good example. Um, I was in Cambodia over a decade ago uh, on a trip to, which uh, it's like a youth exhibition trip to help an orphanage. So I met a friend there. Um, my Cambodian friend came up to me and, and she offered me a grasshopper. So my first response was, you know, <coughs> ew, it looks very unappetizing. You know, I'm scared to eat it, right? And, you know, I probably said ew too much times, you know. So my friend very kindly put her hand on my forearm. She's such a kind person, you know, I love her so much. She put my, her hand on her, my forearm and she said, Sherry, you guys eat potato chips, right? This grasshopper is like our potato chip. So essentially what she did there kind of like woke me up. You know, like it stuck with me till today, even though it's been over a decade. Because she had used the example of potato chips, which she knows that it's what I'm familiar with in my culture to explain to me how her culture is to her. She had successfully shifted my perspective to help me you know, understand what eating a grasshopper from her perspective is. So I'll be eternally grateful for that experience. And um, you know, I, I, honestly, if I haven't, hadn't had traveled to Cambodia back then, I, I wouldn't know when I would have this experience to have that perspective shift. Okay, so the next one I'm going to talk about is 
assumptions. So everyone makes assumptions. I know somebody I really like disagree with me, but I'm going to try to explain to you why. I say everyone makes assumptions. I'm going to tell you two of my travel stories again. The first one is in Korea. So when I was in Korea, I had so much comments about me looking like a Korean. I'm not a Korean. I, my ethnicity is Chinese, Southeast Asian. I was born in Malaysia and I probably had like a bit of Thai in the mixture in my ancestry. So, but I, I look Korean to the Koreans. So there was one day, <coughs> my, my friend and I went to the shop, or shop seller, you know, something like this shop that you can see in this photo. And I was trying to buy something from her, but I couldn't speak Korean and she didn't know, knew, know how to speak English. So I asked my friend, who is a Caucasian American, to help me to buy the food from her. In Korea, as I know very well, it's only respect that you, you know, they really expect the respect from you when you're a younger when you're younger than them, you know, so, so the younger generation has to respect the elders. So she viewed me, she, she assumed that I was Korean and she straight away assumed that I wouldn't, I didn't want to speak to her even though I was Korean. And I got my Caucasian American friend who didn't really have a good command of the language to speak to her instead. So she was telling, she, she got really upset, really angry. She was telling my <coughs> Caucasian American friend, why wouldn't your friend speak to me? She's Korean. I want to speak to her. You know, this is disrespect. And because my Caucasian American friend didn't have the vocabulary to, to tell her and explain to her that I, I'm not Korean, um, she didn't understand that situation. It was a sad ending because we had to leave the stall without buying our food and she remained confused to why a young Korean lady wouldn't want to speak to her. So this is based on assumptions. And I want to share with you a second story. Um, <clears throat> this is when I'm traveling in Canada. Again, we, I was at a motel <coughs> with a friend. When it's time to check out, I was the one that's going to pay. So I gave out my credit card. I, I, I probably had said something like, you know, um, here, I would like to check out. Can you, could you please process this or you know, something like that? So I had said something in English. I couldn't remember the exact sentence. But what happened next was something that struck me because she, she had a question about the credit card. My credit card's from, from Singapore. It, but it's, inter, it's for international usage. So she had a question about it. And it's fair enough. But her question was solely directed to my friend who is Caucasian Canadian. So my friend who is Caucasian Canadian, um, he didn't like that at all. He got really upset and he started saying, why didn't you direct the question to my friend? She's the card holder. You know, she is the one that spoke to you. So her response was, oh, you know, I couldn't understand her. I didn't know that she was speaking English, you know, because based on my accent, she couldn't understand me. And my friend got even more upset. He said, no, I was right beside her all this time. You know, she spoke in perfect English, you know, her accent might be different, but she was understandable. So, you know, um, eventually the situation solved, bit, you know, on its own kind of like, you know, she, I, I think she, she just proce she processed the card with limited exchange with me. Um, but uh, this story really struck me as well, because it's also based on an assumption, based on my looks, based on my accent. So the reason why I'm telling you these two stories is because it happens very often. <clears throat> and I would like to tell you some techniques how to fight assumptions. So first we got to accept that every one of us make assumptions every day. That's how our brains are evolved, evolved to do. If we are unsure whether that, that's a predator or not, you know, back when we are cavemen, caveman time, if we are unsure that, oh, is that a predator or is it not? That's already too late. So this is why, um, evolutionally speaking, we base our decision a lot on assumptions. So once you accept that first step, we can move on to the second step, which is to recognize and identify your assumptions. So try to identify them. And once you are able to identify them, you start to question them. And this is a very hard thing to do because um, 
the reason why our brains made the assumption is because we generally believe that that's the case. So to question it is like going, going against ourselves, going against our belief. But then again, always try because sometimes things don't appear as what it seems. Okay, so this one technique to fight assumptions. So let's move on to the next one. <coughs> Skills and techniques. Okay, so, so before you meet someone from a different culture, there are some preparation that you can do, you know, like, like armor that you can have to wear first. And the first one is to know the vulgar words and offensive gestures. I can give you an example, like popular rap, Popular rap culture, in some songs, right, rappers like to use the N-word. I'm not going to mention what N-word is, but I believe most of you would know. So for a person that's not from this culture, hearing those <coughs> N-words in, in those songs, they might get confused because you know, they would think that, oh, in the media, it's popular, everyone is using it, why can't I use it? You know, so so I, I think... It's um, with today's in day in today's day and age, whereby there's social media and, and lots of globalization happening, it is a uh, it's almost not an excuse to not know what the N word is. You know, not, not to know. You know, do your research before you go to a different country or, or connect with someone from a different culture. That's all I could advise. Um, I personally think that you know, um, even African American rappers shouldn't be using the N word, although they feel like they are justified to use, but because uh, it, it, it portrays a different message to someone who's not from their culture. Um, and <laughs> another story I can tell you is about the, the squinting of eyes. Um, this is a very popular one for, for against Asian culture. And I can, I can tell you a story, which is a very innocent story. Um, when I was in Canada, I met someone who's a Caucasian Canadian. And she... I would realize, I would notice that she always, when she smiles at me, she would squint her eyes. And she doesn't do that to anybody else. You know, she doesn't do it to my husband or anybody else. And I, then I started to notice a pattern. She will only do it to me when, when I am very excited and I, I laugh. You know? So I then realized that maybe her response was to squint back at me because I was uh, unknowingly squinting myself. But honestly, I did not squint because that was just my face. So, you know, it is an innocent thing, you know, she was clearly ignorant, but I, I don't blame her. I know who she is. So, you know, I, I don't, I wasn't offended by it, but I can see how this can be offensive. If I were to be someone else, I weren't, if I weren't her friend and I didn't know her well. So be careful, know, know what's offensive first before you make such an innocent mistake because sometimes it can really offend someone. <coughs> so the next one I can, I can go through with you is... Uh, using of inclusive language <coughs> um so you know in there, there's like words really matters especially when you type out emails or you know even when even verbally you know because sometimes a simple word like in within or off you know it can change the whole meaning of the sentence the first one i have is indigenous people in or within canada and this is a good one to use instead of indigenous people of Canada because when you use possessive terms like of it it make it seem like you know indigenous people are you know are owned by Canada right so try to avoid using that use in and within instead and the next one is put the people first you know instead of putting the disability first so for example you can say <coughs> or you can address someone as people who are deaf instead of deaf people because when you say deaf people it puts the disability first and you know it some some people with disabilities they might not like it because they don't want to be labeled as their disability the next one is a very common one and i honestly have a story as well but i believe you guys know you would have your own version of it Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. It's better to use those words instead of thank you, guys or girls, even though you say it to a bunch of guys. Because I can tell you a story whereby I have uh, been in this group, group setting, whereby someone was telling me, oh, just check out with the girls. And I know in that girl, in that group of girls, there was someone from the LGBTQ community. So we got to be careful about it sometimes. You know, and the last one is things like, you know, when you're speaking to someone who, who's blind, 
say say very specific things like <coughs> the hardcover book is on the table behind you instead of it is behind you because when you are not having the sight it's very hard to know what is behind you okay so now when you finally meet someone what can you do firstly try to know their name be patient i know sometimes foreign name can be really hard as an immigrant myself i know that very well i'm always very forgiving and but the thing that touched me a lot is when people try to ask whether they have pronounced it right because it shows me even if they don't pronounce it right it shows me that they care to try to get it right and that's all that is needed and I think another thing to add about names is about asking them how they would like to be addressed because in some cultures you know in asia um younger people uh, are not um not supposed to address the elders by the their first name right so for example usually younger siblings would call um, older brother, how are you? Your older sister, how are you? They wouldn't call their older siblings by their first name. So ask them, how would you be, prefer to be addressed? That's the best way. And next, try to find out what their gender pronouns are if they have, <coughs> because don't assume based on their looks that they have a, a different gender pronouns than what you think they have. Um, there, there are a lot of different gender pronoun now, pronouns nowadays. So you, if you hear something that you don't recognize, you can always Google to research. And I always, I always like to, you know, the next one you can use to try to kind of like eyes break, break the eyes of someone that, who's from a different culture to so learn how to say their hello. Whenever like I've traveled to like 17 different countries and the first thing that I learned how to say is their hello. And a lot of them stuck with me too today. So when you learn how to say hello in their own language, right? It shows them that you have the, you have the, the, the drive or the motivation to try to learn their culture, to try to connect with them. And that's how you make, you, know, you start making a friendly connection, a friendlier connection. <clears throat> and now body language you know, this is an interesting one as well so communication is not just all about words sometimes about body language in japan in south korea when you say thank you they bow and the bowing whether it's 90 degree or whether it's you know, 70 degree it means a lot so you got to learn how to bow you know whether it's 90 degrees at which situation is 90 degrees at which situation is 70 degrees you know learn how to do that you know, instead of a handshake, you bow. <coughs> in some cultures, like over here, a handshake is generally accepted. From where, where I'm from in um, Malaysia and Singapore, um, there, are lady, there are Muslims, Islamic people, there are Muslims, and um, the ladies generally wouldn't, are uh, not allowed to touch uh, the opposite gender. So their, their, their religion wouldn't allow them to shake the hands of the opposite gender. So when you travel to countries with Islamic and Muslim people, um, you got to be aware. Usually what they'll do is when they greet you, they'll put their hand at their chest and they'll do a slight bow, you know, say hi. You can follow them, let them take the lead, right? Because you, you don't want to like overstep boundary and do something that, that you cannot rectify. Because when, if their religion tells them that you cannot touch the hand of the opposite gender, and you are the opposite gender and you accidentally touch them, it's not something that you can take back because it's already done. So let them take the lead, be, be careful. <coughs> the, next, the next tip I can show you is a easier, easier vocab. And this is a very, very interesting clip. So before I show you, um, I'm going to tell you this, uh, this movie is, the title is called Ace Ventura. And I forgot the, the full title, but Ace Ventura is a, is a movie with a lot of series, and this is one of them. I can show you the small snippet from YouTube. Hey, Quincy! <coughs> oh, yeah! What does he Quincy urge on me? White devil. Well, tell them I'm not. I've only met you. How do I know? Hey, Quincy! Oh, yeah! hey, Quincy! Oh, yeah! He said, let me guess, white devil, white devil? Yes, you speak what you do. Tell them what I'm saying. I come me in peace. In Quensu Orcha, Uza, in Koso Zana. I couldn't help but notice that Equensu Orcha part. 
Did you just refer to me as White Devil? This how they know you. Leave that part out from now on. I represent the princess. Indi, in Kosazana. War is hell. The last thing we want is a fight. Iluwa manje, noma ohambe. So, um, yeah, so that was an interesting clip and I'm going to um, talk more about it. So firstly, um, he said, right, did you just address me as white devil? You know, leave that part out. So, you know, when we go to a different culture, ask them, you know, how do you prefer to be addressed, right? And then he starts saying, like, I represent the princess. So represent could be a higher level vocab as compared to, say, he could use, like, I have been asked by the princess to come here or the princess, you know, make me come here. You know, just use easier vocab because he's speaking to a tribe that doesn't know English at all, including the interpreter. I mean, he has limited knowledge of English, right? So look, if you can remember his facial expressions, you know, Jim Carrey, the actor Jim Carrey is really a very good actor. So you can see how his facial expression wasn't matching to what he was saying because he said he come in I come in peace but his facial expression was so um, elaborated it almost seems like it, it could almost be misinterpreted especially if you don't know what he just said or the language that he was speaking so this also shows us how body language facial expression is very important when you're trying to communicate to someone who doesn't understand your language okay so now we can move on. You know, if say you go to a different country, <clears throat> you don't want to be like a Jim Carrey, right? You can, of course, you can depend on technology now, translator apps. And translator apps are really good. It has evolved you know, over the years. I have been using translator app all my life because I'm a bilingual, English and Mandarin, and my Mandarin is not as good as my English. So I, you know, I use it all the time. And I've seen how it has changed over the years. <clears throat> but I have to, I, I, I do notice that I have to, tweak my words and my sentences but I key into the translator app sometimes because things like idioms, phrasal verbs, you wouldn't want to put it in there. For example, um, stomach full of butter butterflies. Some, some translator apps will translate, literally translate it to stomach full of butterflies or break a leg, you know, or um, you know, I can't think of some now, but cat on hot bricks or idioms like that, you know, so, or once in a blue moon, you know. So if you want to get your point across, right, use easier terms. Instead of stomach full of butterflies, I'm so nervous, right? And instead of um, once in a blue moon, you know, it only happens infrequently or happens once in a while, right? So, but nowadays it's been getting better. So you got to, and there, there's of course ratings out there. So you can search on Google and see which is the best app for you. So the next one, I'm going to show you another short clip. <coughs> this is from 90 Day Fiancé. And 90 Day Fiancé is a reality TV show showing how couples from the two different countries or cultures get together. And, and it's 90 Day before the um, 90 Days Fiancé, meaning that they want to marry, but the, the, the government's giving them 90 days to decide. So after that 90 days, they'll have to marry. If not, they wouldn't have that visa for the spouse that they're trying to bring over from a different country. So this, this is Alina and her fiancé, uh, Stephen, I believe. And um, I'm going to show you a small clip of how he used hand gestures to when he's trying to communicate with someone from a different culture. So I'm going to go back to YouTube and show you. Uh, YouTube. This is a two-part... I'm oh, sorry, I need to go back to the YouTube. This is a two-part session so this is part number one that i'm going to I'll play the second part after this is done sherry if you would like to uh, share your screen because we cannot see sorry the, if you can share, uh, share your screen please oh okay my screen is not shared Oh, yeah, I'm just wondering why is my screen not shared. Let me see, okay. So sorry about that. Oh, it must have stopped sharing. Okay, I'm going to share now. Sorry about that. I'm going to replay that video for you guys. Uh, 
Are you able to see me now? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just wondering what this. Okay, I'm gonna replay that part again. So today is a really big day for is me. It, is it the is the audio good? Yes, we can see it and we can hear it perfectly. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Yes. I'm gonna be proposing yes. to Ooh. my girlfriend. Fine, fine. So it's really important for me that this yes. day goes perfectly. Because I want my girlfriend Alina to yeah. remember it forever. The whole reason we can't Okay, so this is the first part of the video. And now I'm going to go to the second part because the second part of the video has more of his hand talking. I think the plan is once we get to the waterfall, mm -hmm. me and my girlfriend will like walk wow. up the stairs yes. and then we'll be on top of the boat. Okay. And that's when I'll play the piano for her. Fine, okay. And then after I play the piano, okay. that's when I'm going to ask the question. So, yeah. make sure you keep it a secret. Don't tell her. Keep it a secret, okay? Okay. <laughs> Ooh, I'm so nervous. I'm hungry also. Okay, and he's hungry also. So now back to the presentation. Um, so as you can see, he is a hand talker. And in some cultures, hand talker can be seen as a bit offensive, but um, so you got to know what gestures to use because some gestures can be offensive. But uh, I believe you know, I made an observation. This is my personal observation. I am a hand talker as well. And my personal obs observation is a lot of people from Singapore are also a hand talker. And I, I think it's because back back then, you know, when uh, our past generations, when they come as an immigrant to Singapore, um, there's a, like a melting pot of different cultures. So they have to find ways to communicate with each other. So we become like, we have evolved to become hand talkers. This is just my observation. But uh, it is a good way to try to explain to someone who's from a different culture or doesn't speak the same language as you, with you, um, your point across. You can use your hands to even draw on a piece of paper, draw, and I have that done to me before. Like when I travel, I traveled in the past to a place which I have no knowledge of the language. I literally had to draw something on paper and the other person would draw back to me. So these are ways you can use. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about how language evolves. So, <coughs> you know, in Singapore, there are four, four main languages and multiple other nationality languages. Um, so the four main ones are Mandarin, Tamil, you know, Malay and English. So we have uh, evolved to come up with a, a common understanding you know, of, a, a, you know, people, some people call it pigeon language, but it's called Singlish. It's a kind of English, we use the alphabet, but it has four different languages combined. You know, for example, this word, it says, this sentence says, a woman pato always makan at kopi tiang wan. You know, even the accent is different, right? So it, it basically, you see how a is, a is a Tamil, right? Hey, it means hey. Woman, woman means we in Mandarin. And this is a dialect of Chinese, pato Cantonese. So you could be Singaporean and you could, not know what Cantonese is, but if you are Singaporean, you know what Tato is. So this is English for you. And always is English. Makan is Malay. And yet again, you could be Singaporean and not a Singaporean Chinese and not know Malay. But if you are Singaporean, you will know what Makan is. So this is what Singlish does to you, right? At Kopi Tiam. Kopi is a Malay word combined with a Hokkien dialect or Hakka dialect, Tiam, which means short, right? One, and I, I don't really understand what one is, but we use one. So it is Singlish. So what, what I'm trying to say is, when you're trying to communicate, there is a purpose, right? The language becomes a tool of communication. Um, the accuracy doesn't matter as much because the, the, the whole point is to get your point across. Every Singaporean will understand what this means. And that's enough because you got, you got your point across. But uh, having said that, right, I want you guys to also know about <coughs> preservation of language, especially the indigenous languages in Canada. Because as you can see from Singlish, right, the example on the right to the left, um, the accuracy is not important as important as, um, say, Plate Tennis language, the Dhaka language. Because in, in preservation of language, when you communicate with someone in Canada, that the other person would already know English, but the purpose of communicating is less so of trying to get them to 
get your point or understand you. The, the purpose of the communication is to learn the language, to preserve the language. So it becomes more important for us to try to like have the correct word said, you know, to preserve the accuracy. And But having said that, right, I believe if you made a mistake, if you pronounce it wrongly, it's forgivable and people are really kind. They wouldn't take it harshly. You just need to apologize to them, rectify what you've said and keep learning, you know, keep being humble, learn, don't be afraid to ask. Okay. So my next slide, don't be afraid to ask. This is quite straightforward. <laughs> when, you are, when you are learning, you know, always ask questions. You, you don't want to be assuming you, you don't want to be shy. And if you're shy, you don't ask, you, mis, you miscommunicate because you don't know what the person is trying to say to you. The person doesn't know what you are trying to say to them. So don't be afraid to ask, right? And when someone asks you, um, don't, don't be afraid to, you know, you know don't, don't, be, don't be impatient. Just be patient with them, you know, uh, try your best. It's always a learning both ways. So you might be a good asker, the other person might be a, you know, um, a bad listener but then again we are always learning so you can try to be a better listener next time you know apologize be humble and practice makes perfect you know to learn a language to learn about the culture you really got to cross extend your cultural borders you know uh, do things with people from a different culture from you you know like celebrate their celebrate their cultures um, attend their festivals, ask them about their history, ask them what their word, that word means, right? Work as a team to finish that goal. You know, this is a picture of the festival Holi in India. <clears throat> and lastly, if you have the opportunity, travel. Because travel, you know, when I travel, you know, I understood what it is to be a Singaporean. So when you start to travel, you start to realize what your culture means because um, I had never thought a lot that way until, you know, until then because I was, I always thought that my culture is normal and it is, and it's the way it is, you know. So again, you know, you see what you want to see, you see it from your culture. So when you start to meet people from a different culture, whether you travel or whether you stay in the same country, when you meet someone from a different culture, your perspective shifts. You see it from a different culture now. You see, oh, wow, that is normal to them as well. So, and lastly, to conclude, um, I would like to quote Martin Luther King. We may all come from different ships, but we are in the same boat now. And I've attended an Indigenous learning workshop recently, and they gave an example of the kayak or the canoe with, with the paddles or the oars, quite. And the oars and the paddles are like tools, which, which are the tools of communication. So in order for the kayak to move forward and progress towards the destination, you and your, your partner, right? The person that you're communicating with has to know how to have to know how to use the oar properly. So this is the whole point of the speech today, is trying to teach or trying to like share ideas and con concepts and techniques, how to, to learn how to use the oars properly so that we can communicate with somebody else from a different culture better and easier, and then we can move the boat forward. Okay, so now that I've come to the end of my presentation, um, I guess we can start with the Q&A. Yes, um, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you, uh, Cherry. Mm -hmm. Now, um, sharing my screen. yes, uh, thank you. Now that uh, Cherry mentioned, we <laughs> have a, 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers from our audience. And uh, just please pose your questions in the uh, Q&A speech bubble on the bottom of your screen. And we'll share them with Cherry and she will answer any questions that you have. So we'll give them a few minutes to post their questions <laughs> in there. And in the meantime, uh, Cherry, I don't know if you would like to um, ask them uh, about yeah, the questions uh, that you've had before. Um, the presentation, yeah. Oh, the presentation that I had, yeah. Yes, like the questions that you had in the beginning. Yeah, I'm going to so. post it now. I'm doing it now. So I'm going to post it in the chat now. Uh, let's see if I can actually copy and paste. I'm trying to copy it from my word, but it doesn't seem to let me. 
Just hold on a minute. Or also, if you if you don't have any questions, if you want to post like a message for uh, Terry, also you can you can post any. Okay, so I have a uh, copy and paste something, and I think because it's a very long passage, it cuts into half. So I'm going to copy the rest after connection connecting to roots. I think that's the one disconnected. So we have a, a question from a, a person that is asking, which <laughs> countries have you visited? I mean, sorry, which countries you have visited have the largest number of languages spoken in the same place? Okay. Um, I think because I'm from Singapore and Malaysia, so there is a lot of languages there. No? So I, 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 I'm like, I'm very, I, I would like to say it's Singapore, but other countries, I would also, I would think maybe New York, because I was in New York, in Boston as well, usually the bigger cities, New York, Boston, when they have like a melting pot of different cultures, Australia is one of them as well. Um, the bigger cities, the rural areas are tend to be more monoculture, but uh, different, the most number of different languages. I, it's very hard for me to compare between different big cities like New York, Boston, Australian cities. Um, but because I'm from Singapore myself, so, uh, and I do know that Singapore and Malaysia has like a very, you know, all the nationalities and all the immigrants and also the four main languages that government recognized. So it's it's quite uh, it's quite hard to say which is the most, like which one, maybe Singapore, maybe Malaysia, you know, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Terry. And we have a question from Angela Corbin. And the question is, what do you think we should be teaching children in school about getting along with students from other, other cultures? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, see, I, I have asked this question myself as well to a, to a mentor of mine. And I think her answer was, you know, she gave me some resources. So at the top of my head, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to like get it out for you because they're they are probably somewhere on the web. But there are resources out there to, to help with, you know, to tell you what you should teach children, you know, how you should um how you should say it in an easier way. I think from a perspective of being a teacher myself to kids, I would like to say that, you know, kids they have very short attention time span. So number one, if you want to say anything to them, especially things like this, right? It's good to be concise and make it small, make it bite-sized for them, make it short and sweet. And then number two, like what I mentioned, use easier vocab. So translate everything into kid language. You know, instead of the iceberg, right? I show you the iceberg with all the different words, and then there's like traits like biases. You know, you get rid of the biases. And I think it's a very good activity. I might I would love to do it in my students one day to get them to draw an iceberg themselves and then insert their own words because you don't have to insert jargons like. Uh, you know, core values and whatnot. You 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 got you can teach them like oh food, right? Dress, you know, or shirt, or shoes. And then the below the surface, you can say things like, oh um, my favorite, my favorite, you know, my favorite uh, activity or my, you know, my dreams, like what I my thinking or like just simple words like that. So they enjoy the activity, but they also kind of like know the concept of oh above the surface people can see it better but below the surface they may not see it because I dream you know if I don't tell anyone my dreams nobody will know what it is right so simple activities like that hands-on activity is always one good one for kids as well all my lessons are all very hands-on um, music um, getting them to interact with one another I've seen a documentary recently I think by BBC maybe I'm wrong but it's a British documentary whereby they have uh, children of different cultures at a dinner table and they, they explain that they get the children to explain what food they're eating from their own cultures what food they're eating and um, the children love it a lot I mean they just share their food a lot. of course they are picky eaters as well and then some kids wouldn't want to eat it but then again you know it's a good exposure because you don't have to eat it on the first time or the first try you just got to be exposed and over time right the kids are very um, they learn so fast and they're like sponges. 
So over time, they'll be used to it. They'll be like, oh yeah, that's not so strange. That's actually what my best friend likes to eat. It's almost like how I ate the grasshopper for the first time and my dear friend, you know, from Cambodia, she gave me that perspective shift. You know, if, if kids were to have that at a younger age, I think it will be better. It will be easier for them to go through that, you know. A gradual perspective shift instead of like mine I get I went through like suddenly and it's a good thing that I experienced it a decade ago yeah so I hope you answer your question thank you Terry uh, we have another question and it says I really like your personal anecdotes about your travels your personal experience helped to underline the points you were making and a very interesting talk thank you Right, and I have another question from Angela Corbin. Um, saying thanks, Cherry. I love the iceberg idea for teaching children about getting along with others, simple and practical. And I I agree, um, also with uh with the iceberg, right? Like uh, for us teachers, I think it's uh, very <laughs> simple and practical, and and I think that will work like really really well with a lot of us, of our students. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to give a few more seconds uh, for people to pose their questions and the messages that anyone wants to post here. And again, it was it was a very interesting uh, presentation, Cherry. And um, we have one more comment from Claire Chai. Very engaging presentation. Thank you. Love the videos and personal stories. Thank you so much. And Clary is my sister, by the way. She's my twin sister. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I, I just got a question. Um, I just pasted the, the thinking question. I'm not sure if everybody could see it. Maybe you can give me some feedback if somebody could, you know, if I pasted it correctly into the chat. Yeah, um, you pasted it correctly in the uh, in oh, the chat okay. box, but yes, we don't we don't have <coughs> any answers from that one yet. Okay, well, we don't have any more questions um, on the chat and on the uh, chat box. And well, I wanna thank you uh, again, uh, Cherry, for this amazing presentation. Um, definitely was it was something very interesting to to learn. Um, I want to thank also to our media uh, sponsor, CBC Daybreak North, and everyone who was able to join us tonight as well. <laughs> and we're working on our March virtual adult speaker series. Watch for updates on our social media and website. It's uh, already cooking and ready to go for March. So um, make sure to visit our social media and website. And well, that's everything from my part. Have a great night, everyone. and. Well, have fun and stay safe. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carlos, for hosting and have a great night. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.